Hey everybody, it's Father Taylor. Um, I know it's late, but happy Trinity Sunday. And um, just with everything that's been going on, all the the rioting, the protesting, the different, I guess, ways in which people have been trying to show justice for, for George Floyd, we've obviously seen how that has been a positive thing, us moving towards justice. Um, we've also seen where there's been abuses in it. Um, there's been people who have also been asking, they, you know, they want to hear more from their priest on this issue of, of racism and everything. And particularly this Sunday, Trinity Sunday, is a time where I guess some people are kind of really wanting us to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the unity of God, the diversity of God, but also how we're made in the image and likeness of God. So I wanted to just kind of basically give my homily from this Sunday for y'all to kind of reflect on and just sort of hear, you know, hear some message of hope. Um, there's parts of it that are challenging. There's parts that are obviously us moving practically and forward. So essentially, when we look at the lives of the saints, you know, we never really find a saint by themselves. If we do, there's always some way in which they connect to the other saints. But very much when we study the lives of the saints in depth, we can find overlap. We find how saints have overlapped with other saints. There's been saints who, you know, worked in the same ministry, worked in the same country, the same city, same council, all these different things. And it's not just happenstance. It's not just that they just so happen to be together. They just so happen to find themselves in the same thing. No, they're like drawn to each other by that divine magnet, by sort of almost the gravitational pull of God that, that is, is rooting himself in their hearts. And so it's not uncommon for some to find saints, you know, living contemporaries with each other. And also, they're not just acquaintances. The saints were never just sort of like they knew each other in passing. They kind of met each other one time. It was a good kind of little conversation they had and they just moved on. No. But the saints had deep, really deep friendships together. A deep friendship that went really to the heart, to the core. And we see this in the light of many saints, like St. Gregory Nazianza and St. Basil, where they literally said, we felt as if we had two, two bodies, but one soul. You know, it's such a union they had together, but they said, you know, we, we're different. I mean, there's a diversity, but there's this unity together. One of my favorite examples um, that I've obviously been praying with a lot recently has been St. Rose of Lima and, and Martin, Martin de Porres. Rose has been a very beautiful saint of mine, a great patroness who herself has reached out into my life. Um, but, Mart, but Rose had a very deep friendship with Martin. Martin you know, grew up about a block or so down from her house. Um, Martin de Porres Velasquez was his full name. He was an outcast. He was the son of a, a Span Spanish man of white skin and of a, a mother of black skin from Panama. She was, she was you know, yeah, at that time we would be considered a Negro. She was from Panama. And they had a child. They had this child, Martin. And he grew up as an outcast. You know, at the time they would have called him a mulatto. Of a bit kind of an offensive term of one who was born from a white mother, a, a white father and a white mother. Um, he was a very humble man because of this very outcast. He joins the Dominicans and he's given a humble position. He's the janitor. He's the barber. Um, but he's so humble and he's so charitable. Martin has this beautiful charity to him. He, he would go out into the streets and care for the poor to the point that he would take them in and put them in his own bed. And the superiors would actually forbid him from doing that. But he says, the time it would take for me to wash the filth from my own sheets in my bed is nothing compared to the time it would take for me to wash the filth from my heart of uncharity. Martin began to perform so many miracles and healings that he was, he was again forbade out of obedience from performing miracles. Um, and Rose loved Martin. They loved each other so much they would spend hours and hours in the church of Santo Domingo praying, talking, you know, talking about heaven, talking about virtue, talking about the life of God.
but they were so different. First of all, a man and a woman, you know, spending that much time, Rose who had made a personal vow of virginity, you know, and then just this, this cultural context, you know, clashing between the two of them. But they found in each other that spiritual union that drew them together. The image that I, I find with it is an image from St. Francis de Sales, where he says, bees will collect pollen from various flowers of different color, of different variety, of different, different species, taking all the good pollen from these sweet flowers and forging it together in a sweet, ar aromatic, beautiful, delicious honey. And very much as a bee does that with flowers, so the Holy Spirit, Spirit did that with Rose and Martin, taking from their lives, taking the good virtue, the spirituality they wished to share, and forged this beautiful friendship that now in heaven is, is, is stronger than ever, stronger than anything. And so that's a beautiful image, first of all, that we celebrate on this, this Trinity Sunday. The diversity that comes from God himself. God himself was a unity of three persons in one. We, we, it's one of the central mysteries of our faith, really. God is three, God is one. Three persons, one God. How is that? We talk about you know, the image of fire. How fire, we have the flame, we have the heat, we have the light. All three of them are different, but yet all of them are fire. And it's one way we can look at to imagine God. But we can also imagine it in this way. Last night I had a wedding, and it was a beautiful wedding. It was you know very always, I love weddings, and one of the images I always remind them is the image of God as the lover. You know the Father is the lover. God is love, and He is pure love, true love. He's not stagnant. He's not selfish, but God's love is constantly outpouring because that is what love is. It's self gift. It's not selfish. It's not egotistical. But before the creation of the world, what did God love? God loved himself. But his love is not selfish. How does God love himself in an unselfish way? Well, it's the diversity of the persons. The Father loves the Son. The Son who is not born, who is not created, but is begotten. So the Father loves the Son because the Son is himself. The Son is God. And so... God from God, light from light, you know, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The Father loves the Son in this way. And that love they have between them, the love that the Father pours out, the gift of self is so real, is so personal that it's another person. That the love between them is the Holy Spirit. And so you have between them these three persons, the Father, who is the lover, the Son, who is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit that is the love. In this big exchange of love, of beloved, of the love itself. And we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are made in the image and likeness of this trinity, this diversity, this communion of God. And so in our hearts, we have that image. So as I was saying, in, the, in marriage, we have the, the full image of it. Marriage is a natural sacrament because it, sim it affects what it symbolizes. The husband, the lover, the, the wife, the beloved. And they form such a full and perfect union. Such a one flesh that comes from the outpouring of themselves. Such a real gift of self. That, that their love becomes another person. It becomes the child. The child is the union of the one flesh. It is their love that has been so real and so outpoured. And so we already have in our bodies knit that image of creation, of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, of the Trinity in our own self. And so we heard this, you know, th this morning Mass, St. Paul telling us the great call, you know, to strive for peace, to, to set aside all this unity, that the social doctrine of the church, our action doesn't come just from you know, a political gain doesn't just come from sort of the, you know, the church authority trying to push down and say, okay, you need to do this and, and let's just arbitrarily make some laws. But no, it's founded on the identity of God that's in our hearts, really the identity of us. So the reason why we have subsidiarity, the reason why we have solidarity, the, the preferential option for the poor 
is because we're made for that union. We're made for communion. We're made to form love and to draw all people together. So all the social doctrine of the church is to try and do that. The entire moral life is really us just trying to live in harmony with the, the dignity and the reality we have. But what happened? Original sin. Adam and Eve sinned. They broke union with God. They broke union with themselves. They broke union with one another. Man fights against woman. You know, husband, I mean, father fights against son. Brother fights against brother. We see that from the beginning. I mean, right after Adam and Eve sinned, the first sin is fratricide. Brother killing brother. I mean, this is original sin. We, we can't argue with that. That is original sin. It's the, that's the fe- effect of original sin. This disunity. And the thing is, we can't completely heal that wound by ourselves. It is our goal, but we have to have, above all, the grace of God. God has to interact with us. God, ha- We have to cooperate with God's action. I mean, again, the gospel for this Sunday. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That we can form that unity again. That we can have etched in our heart again the image of God that we had lost. And so we've seen in our world in these past days, in the political things, the protests and everything, the, 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 the righteous cry of justice. But what happens? It, it goes back really to ultimately what happened with Moses. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth was not a law that was placed to be, I guess you could say, restrictive, or really it wasn't given to be permissive of like, okay, someone takes an eye from you, you can take an eye back. But no, it was supposed to, in a sense, wrangle in man's passions. Man's passions that wanted, when they saw an injustice, to just rage against it. That is the effect of original sin. When we see an injustice, it's retribution, it's revenge, it's hatred that we respond in. And so that that is what comes from original sin. It's the law of charity, though, that is supposed to forge the true meaning. And so, yes, we have two things at play here. First of all, we have the need to eliminate racism, hatred, discrimination, because we have this diversity of people, diversity of languages, just the beauty of every single person. Again, these various flowers that all are producing pollen that that the Lord wished to forge together. But then we also have to recognize within us a brokenness that cannot be formed and healed by our efforts, by our philosophies, by our protests alone. And that's the danger we have to focus on. Yes, we need to speak up against these injustices, but if we completely separate from the spirituality, if we completely separate it, from the sinful nature, the woundedness, the call of holiness, we will never get a, the just, we'll never get the final resolution, and we will just spawn more and more hatred. So what, what do we do is the question, right? How do we speak up? How do we properly fight against racism and all this hatred and everything? In the right way. The first thing, above all, first thing, each one of us has to get our own life back in union with God. We have to forge our lives back in union with God the Father. If my own heart is disunited, if I'm discriminating against myself, I'm hating myself, if I'm hating myself through sin, through self-condemnation, through guilt, through past burdens, wounds, I cannot minister to another. As Jesus himself said, before you look at a brother and say, let me take that, that speck out of your own eye, Jesus says, take the plank out of your own. We have to first go in our own heart, remove that plank, and then we can go and minister to our brother. So confession, frequent confession, frequent prayer, penance, you know, in our own life, straightening the things that are disordered in our own life. I mean, it it makes sense. We have to straighten the things in our life that are disordered. Second, in your own families. Mother Teresa said, if you want peace in the world, go home and love your family. Your family is the first place in which society is met, in which society is built. If if we can reform the family, if we can re-minister the family, we can begin to reform society. 
And yes, that means loving our families. It means forgiving them. But it does also mean teaching. It does mean teaching your children, teaching your family, talking to your family about racism, discrimination, all these things. Doing that in the family. Having those little conversations. Why is abortion wrong? Why is birth control wrong? Why is racism wrong? Talking about that in the family. Those conversations need to happen. Third, what, right in your own community, you know, the neighborhood you live in, the people you see, driving down the street, those people you see on the side of the road. And sometimes it's just as simple as smiling and waving. You know, just today I was, I was walking, I was walking around the parking lot on the church and, you know, an African-American guy comes by on a bike, looks at me, I look at him and smile and wave and he says, he says, God bless you, pastor. And he just drives on, you know, it's just little things like that. Like we, we should not have to have, you know, any animosity. And so just those little things of love, stepping out, being prudent as well, you know, being aware of cultural things, but being aware of how, how I can step out maybe just a little way. The fourth way is, of course, making our voice heard, is speaking up for legislation, you know, obviously fighting for pro-life issues. We have to remember how much the abortion issue discriminates against racism. How much it discriminates against races. I mean, it, it, it's not uncommon that abortion, I, I've seen it. I've seen abortion providers go to far off countries or even here in America and target poorer class people. They're trying to eliminate them because they're poor. Eliminating the sufferer rather than trying to eliminate the suffering. That's not right. So, I mean, abortion is something we have to eradicate if we really want to get over racism. That's, I mean, that's, that's the, one of the greatest destroyers of the human race. The human race is the one great race we have to support, first and foremost. And so abortion is destroying that. We have to destroy racism by first destroying the great enemy of the human race, abortion. And then, of course, the other social issues come after that. So immigration issues, poverty, good working class, you know, things that really build up our society. And above all, prayer. Again, it is only by God that we can heal this wound. Like again, with, with Rose and Martin, I mean, their lives had such a great spirit of prayer. that They were able to be forged together by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit knit them together. Again, taking that pollen from their flowers to form that honey. We pray for that in our own lives. We pray that for our own lives. The Holy Spirit would do that in our lives as well. So I pray this message has helped. Some people has touched you. But if anything, I hope it just encourages us to prayer. So again, we ask for the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our countries this weekend. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.